There are great games, and there are genre definers, and there are genre makers. Classic Doom was a game that perfected Wolfenstein's formula, and would then bring forth a sea of shooters using Doom's formula, known as Doom Clones. This in itself would spawn its own genre, while the shooter genre would transform gradually in the background. In the world of hack and slash and action RPG games, it's had various takes on the style of gameplay, shifting with different ideas. In 2009 though, Demon's Souls would spawn the seed of something that would not only revolutionize the genre, yielding a style of hack and slash that cruxed on the use of stamina and prioritizing animations and timing of blows, but it would also spawn its own genre. That seed would be Dark Souls, a game that changed everything for me personally for many different reasons. But that'll be a topic for another time. Since 2014, we've started seeing a surge of Souls-like games, like Lords of the Fallen 2014. They were games that operated on the template of the Soul series and take certain aspects of them, such as stamina-based combat, challenging enemies and bosses, cryptic storytelling with rich lore, a barefooted maiden with a depressed voice, etc. But how they differ is in what else they offer. In terms of quality though, it's usually a mixed bag, with people expecting them to be on the same level of Dark Souls. And there are some that I think are pretty close. The Neo games, Salt and Sanctuary, Lies of P, games that offer freedom in character customization and the freedom to experiment with different builds, all the while challenging you to various degrees like the From Software games do. But in between some of the best come a lot of janky and mixed titles that leave a lot to be desired. One of those games is Mortal Shell. Mortal Shell is a debut effort made by Cold Symmetry, who had a small group of people that were inspired by Dark Souls. It's rich in grim world and it's challenging combat system that offered a great deal of satisfaction to be had. Like other Souls likes, they would then take certain aspects that comprised of that game and they would do their own spin at the same time. Its weighty flow towards fighting enemies, its unique shell mechanic, its misty and atmospheric setting, its quiet and foreboding ambience that permeates the entire experience that would comprise in the creation of this game. It is in the mixed category of Souls-likes, but for what the game is, it's a pretty decent game that I found to have enjoyed myself, and I think it's a great starting point for people wanting to get into this genre. I played it a few years ago, and revisiting it now, my opinion of it hasn't really changed that much. But there was one other game that I was reminded of while playing Mortal Shell, and that's the original Lords of the Fallen, released back in 2014. It was one of the earliest games to be considered a Souls-like, and time hasn't been too friendly to it. I enjoyed it more back then because there wasn't much else around. The recent version is one that I've been enjoying a lot more. Mortal Shell has a similar approach to the original Lords of the Fallen's combat, but more in a rough fashion due to not having as many people fine-tune animations or gameplay. Mortal Shell's combat requires deliberate timing because of the slower transfer between moving and attacking during animations. Large weapons take longer to wind up and smaller weapons are faster but do require more commitment to dishing out damage, leaving you out in the open to enemy attacks still. Lords of the Fallen had a similar approach, big was slow, fast was fast, but they had trade-offs. In comparison, this game feels jankier, especially with the cancellation of attacks from some of the bosses that can catch you off guard really quickly. If you've ever played a Souls game or another Souls-like, you'll come in with a certain level of familiarity. In the beginning, you'll be spending time adjusting to its mechanics and will understand its open-ended approach to progressing its storyline, as evidenced by the points of interest in the areas that can be accessed in any order, another staple of the Souls games that allowed a certain level of freedom to progressing. It's a very weird and cryptic game, even more so than some of the other Souls-likes. From start to finish, you're not going to have a great idea as to what happened, who you are, what's going on, where you are and why. Even with the Souls games, there's some cohesion in the world where you can get an inkling to what's going on. But in Mortal Shell, the game's world is like a dream where a lot doesn't make much sense and the only thing that you understand is that it's a Souls-like. However, like any other Souls game, you take the time to pick apart the lore through item descriptions, matching them up with character dialogue from NPCs to the shells that you upgrade, where you receive some dialogue and, of course, scouring the internet for theories. And that's how you can understand the story of this game better. But for the story itself, well, 
Its setting is mysterious and I kind of like how it makes you work to understand it, quite literally with its familiarity system where to understand an item better, you have to use it, which will unlock the description for it, even if this means using poisonous items without realizing it. From what I can gather, the story of this game revolves around the land that is inhabited by three powerful beings who had consumed this substance called True Nectar that would then corrupt them and then create a division in the land, segregating themselves into the temples that you travel to. Your character, the Foundling, is placed to clean the mess. When you spawn, you're introduced to the game's basic controls and are then faced against the tutorial boss, a boss that's beatable, but one that you can try again later on by starting a new save if you fail. Afterwards, you're thrown into the world of Fulgrim, the centerpiece for where your story begins. Eventually, you come across your first shell, which is the game's most unique feature, which we'll get into later. Not too long, you come across the Fulgrim Tower, which acts as the main hub for the game, where you can talk to twin sister Janissa, the large bird creature who sends you to the temples to retrieve the glands, and a merchant hidden at the top. This place is like your filing shrine, basically, and it connects to all three temples that you can go to, where each one has its own atmosphere, its enemy types, and ultimately, its main bosses that preside over the gland that you need to get. The progression is slow at first, but is shorter than you might think. It's easy to get lost. Most parts of Fulgrim look the same with only the layouts differentiating areas from each other, as well as specific points of interest like the big frog, the bandit that you can get a secret ending from, among other things. For a game of its relatively short size, it does have a fair bit of exploration packed into it, but a lot of that exploration will be a result of going into unknown places, looking for unique paths and attention to small details. People with experience from anything From Software has made since Demon Souls will have a good idea of what to expect, since this game takes inspiration from those games. What you'll find is that this game is quite short. There aren't that many bosses outside of the main three that you fight, and there are four versions of the Grisha boss, as well as several versions of the tutorial boss that have different weapons. Copying and pasting bosses is something that From Software is known for and it's one of their biggest weaknesses. And in a game this short, it's disappointing that three duplicates, as well as other ones, occupied time and space that they could have made instead for more unique boss fights. And one of the other optional bosses is one of those annoying leaping enemies but with poison attacks and more health. The main boss fights themselves though are decent, with the Tarsus boss being the best one. These enemies will basically just be skill checks to see if you've mastered the Harden mechanic that the game revolves around. So what is the Harden ability exactly? Well, it's essentially like your shield, where your foundling character has the ability to withstand just about any attack once it's activated. But as soon as you get hit, it disappears and you have to wait for it to charge up so you can't abuse the mechanic. Age Shell has access to it, and you can activate it at any time while it's still active. Even when you're attacking or jump attacking, you can use it, which can help in some dicey situations where you're usually punished for attacking at the wrong time. Even still, you have to use it carefully due to enemies having a habit of combo attacking and sometimes animation cancelling, and they'll begin the next one in a very janky sense. As for the shells themselves, they comprise of different playstyles, with your first one being a starting point character, Harris, and the rest having different levels of resolve, stamina, and health. Resolve are those little white bars on the bottom left that enable abilities, including parrying, which is placed next to your stamina and health. Eridan is a very tanky shell that has low stamina, but is great if you just want to be aggressive and just keep pummeling enemies over and over again. Tien is the opposite shell. A lot of stamina, but not much health. Solomon has high resolve, and the first character that I just mentioned, Harris, has great skills when you unlock them, which you can get with Tar and Glimpses, the game's currency systems. But if you're feeling like a real challenge, you can do two things. One, don't pick up any shells and just play as the foundling. You'll die in one hit due to having really low health, and you can't rely on the quick chance to return to your shell to get a second go when you die. Two, there's a secret form called the Dark Obsidian form, which relinquishes all of your current shells, and thus you'll be playing without them for the entire game. That is, if you go back to the original locations of those shells, you can then get those shells back. If you're going to do this though, I would highly recommend doing it on a new save. Like other Souls likes, you have New Game Plus, where you can go through the game once more and upgrade further, but after a while you'll get fatigued from the game due to having little variety in both weapons and shells to use. 
Speaking of the weapons, they're all pretty effective and there's no right or wrong really. They all have their strengths and weaknesses and it just boils down to your preferences. For me, I use the Hallowed Sword, which is the first one that you get. But once I had access to the Axe Katana, which is the weapon that you get from the DLC that you buy, and you keep its dual form rather than resorting to the Axe form, it becomes one of the best weapons in the game. And it's my personal favorite. You can only get it though if you've bought the Virtuous Cycle DLC and have acquired all the other weapons. And it also includes the Hadern Shell, the boss that you fight in the tutorial, and for the other weapons. Now when it comes to the loop of combat, you'll be taking your time more or less, slowly drawing out enemies rather than tackling them all at once, and your abilities will help greatly here too. Each shell has their own abilities, and weapon upgrades unlock more abilities to use, and if you have the resources for it, you can eventually acquire a tool that gives you a projectile based weapon that's quite powerful. But one of my favorite abilities in the game is the parry system. When you time it right, you get a chance to deal some big damage, and you can get some health back in the process. If you can master it and memorize the timing of enemy attacks, you'll be able to sustain yourself for longer periods of time without the reliance of supplies. The only problem is, it's tied with your resolve, which means you'll only be able to use it when you have a full single bar of resolve. When you've tired of the main story, you then have the roguelike mode, which is the virtuous cycle, which comes with the DLC. I haven't played the mode that much, but a roguelike spin on the Souls-like formula has always been an interesting concept. Fun and challenging gameplay paired with randomized runs, making for a near infinite experience. It lets you pick a shell and your weapon of preference. You can start it up by going to the second floor of the Fulgrim Tower and talking to the sister statue, or you can do it through the main menu after you've spoken to her in your current save. It plays out pretty much the same, except for a few things, such as randomized enemy placements, objects that can unlock perks that make you stronger, and of course, a permadeath mechanic, where if you die, you fail the cycle and have to start a new one. This is one of those modes that you look into after you've at least finished the main game. But since I have a habit of dying often in Souls games, in either fair or bullshit ways, it's a mode that I'm going to pretty much ignore since permadeath and Souls games don't really mix for me personally, but it's there if you want a challenge. When all is said and done, Mortal Shell is a decent start from a very small studio who have had some neat ideas but with mixed execution, the janky flow of combat, some of the bosses just being duplicates in a relatively small pool of bosses, limited variety in weapons and shell choices, a very cryptic story that's hard to follow compared to other games, as well as janky animations. But when you look at Souls-likes outside of From Software's lineup, you'll generally come across a lot of games that have a degree of jank and imperfection to it anyways. They're never going to be exactly like the Souls game, or Elden Ring, or Bloodborne, or Sekiro, and that's okay. Mortal Shell itself has some nice atmosphere, with a strange world with some interesting lore, decent ambience, and minimal music to fit the mood. The hardened shell, making for unique offensive and defensive opportunities, a loot to play around with, a photo mode for nice pictures, and of course, the best ending ever made in any Souls game. Even though it's short, it's a good starting point for those wanting to get into Souls-like games or are looking for something outside of From Software titles. I do hope that they one day make a sequel to it, with a bigger and more cohesive storyline, more variety in weapons, shells, enemies, bosses, and environments to boot, as well as improvements to core gameplay and the flow of animations. But time will tell in that respect, and there's already a good foundation to work with, which I'm sure will be realized in a sequel with more manpower and resources. Definitely give this game a go though, just keep your expectations at a reasonable level. Stay tuned and thank you for watching. You're welcome to join me, you know. Living the brigand life. Drinking moonshine, snacking on rats. What's the use in trying so hard, anyway? What does any of it matter? Let's enjoy our short lives. What do you say? Best friends forever? Come on, then. Take a seat and have a drink. We can watch life pass on by.